All right, folks. Let's look at our assignments really quickly because there's a couple that we need to probably discuss and talk about just so, and of course I don't have, okay. So let's talk with the one that's Napoleon's success or failure. That's stapled together. It's got this big giant list. So when you're looking at this, you can discuss if it was a success or a failure either for Napoleon himself or for France. I don't care which way you look at that because it'll be different depending on which the context of which you view it. So whichever one you choose, you need to put on your worksheet that Napoleon's success or failure and then afterwards write for Napoleon or for France. And you might want to hold off on which one you choose until we go through and look at. There is not one that's easier than the other. I'm sure that all of you would want to have that. Yes? So do we do it like creation of republics is for France and the next one for Napoleon or do we choose France for all of them? France for all. Okay. France, it's so it, you're either answering that worksheet all about France or all about Napoleon. Um, and some of them would be the same regardless, but there are a couple, probably at least half of them that would be different if you thought about it in the terms of France or in the terms of um, Napoleon. I'll move them. Why did you do that? I'll because they, it was old. Okay. And then <laughs> the worksheet that is about, that has all the quotes, and then you're supposed to talk about what those quotes. This is the second part. This is a Congress of Vienna. And the Congress of Vienna will be a, a significant movement to put Europe back the way it was. And so think about that in that uh, context of um, um, how that works. I'm going to give the DBQ on Monday, and we're going to kind of start working through that. I'll uh, pass that out to you on Monday so that we can start looking at that. Um, your cheat sheet is Congress of Vienna, and your one-pager is Napoleon. All right? Napoleon is a really important figure, um, uh, and um, very much a product of the French Revolution, but still also a product of enlightened despot. Like he is Napoleon. Maybe I'll remember to bring my Napoleon hat that I bought at Napoleon's museum and wear it while I'm discussing Napoleon. Um, so that was when we went to France, you know, when you go on those tours, you're at the mercy of the tour guide and what they want. And so there's sometimes things that you don't get to do or get to see. And for Jason Mann and I, he loves Napoleon. Not He loves Napoleon more than I do. I like Napoleon, I, but he adores Napoleon. He started talking with me. Um, he has brothers and sisters that are my, that were my, uh, kids age that played soccer and travel soccer. And so Nepal Jason and I, does anybody know Jason man? Yeah. Okay. You know, Jason, tell him you're getting ready to tell him get, you're getting ready to stay in the bullet. Like oh, he, I love everything about him. I'm getting ready to tell you at in second grade, we were having discussions about Napoleon. He can tell you everything. Probably not great. <laughs> He loved him there. He, it started with some kind of video game. I don't know. But anyway, we were greatly disappointed to know that the only thing that we were going to see of the museum of the infirmaries where he's buried is just passing by. Like, um, no, that can't happen. So thankfully part of these other dumb trips is they always want to immerse you in the culture. So they were all going to play some kind of game like bocce ball. You know me, I'm not playing a game. So Jason and I and his dad said, we're not doing that. We're going to Napoleon's tomb. And so Jason and I and his dad went to Napoleon's tomb, cried great tears of joy, um, stood in awe. Jason's dad laughing at us, recording us, 
making fun of us. I broke the bank in the Napoleon muse, uh, museum store. Yes. Hat, t-shirt. There's my little Napoleon bust up there. That thing probably cost me about 20 bucks. <laughs> Um, yes. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was pretty awesome. So it was a great trip. Um, so we're at Napoleon. Next time you work with, work with, do you work with Jason often? Next time, just tell him, Hey, I heard about you in Napoleon. Yeah. Jason tried, <laughs> Jason tried to buy a hat as well. Jason has an enormous head and it would That's not true. fit on his head. So yeah, he, he bought it. He had to be the he I know he, he has an enormous him. head. Um, and I have a picture of him with that hat on that I might share because it's hilariously funny. So anyway, all right. So now we're at Napoleon and Napoleon has his own time period. Napoleon affects history. Um, not just in Europe, but also in the United States. It's during this time period that Napoleon sells to Thomas Jefferson, the Louisiana purchase, this big giant uh, swatch of swatch of land in the middle of the United States that becomes obviously really important for us. Uh, we do need to understand for our purposes why he sold it, what he hoped to get out of it. Um, and if we look again, this is this, this chart is not a new chart. This is the same chart from our French Revolution. We see our last bit of um, the um, age of Voltaire, which is the beginning of Napoleon. We have the consulate, and then we have the Napoleonic Empire, of which, and then Napoleon names himself the emperor. He sits across the throne of the thrones of Europe, of Europe, his brothers, his sisters, his sister-in-laws, and in essence, recreates um, absolutism. And that will be the end of that Crane's anatomy thing that we looked at. We get we started with an absolutist king, Louis the 16th, and we ended up with Napoleon, who is the emperor. Just a gentle reminder. And again, I am not saying that you don't know these things, but I just always want to make sure that you understand when we say something is an empire. It means it is full of people of different nationalities, different countries, and different religious beliefs, right? So King Louis was a king because he was only the king of France. Napoleon is an emperor because he is going to be the emperor of almost half of Europe. He is going to conquer a giant, giant part of Europe and will have not only in um, um territory, but he'll also, again, like I said, sit his brothers and sisters and brother-in-laws on the crowns or on the thrones across Europe. So let's talk a little bit about Napoleon um, in and of himself. Napoleon would call himself a child of the Enlightenment. He definitely would. He's a product of that in that he comes from a very... Um, um, non-aristocratic background. He uh, was born of Italian descent to a prominent Corsican family uh, on the French island of Corsica. So Corsica is French, but he has an Italian background. And he's always going to be kind of like the guy on the outside looking to get in to the game, right? His French is not proper French. He is instantly recognized in um, genteel elite uh, uh, circles that he is not French. He is not aristocracy. His his French is not of the elite. And as a result of that, he's always trying to um, um, win his way in. Maddie, what in the world are you looking for? Oh, I'm trying to, I found my things I do in chapters. I'm trying to find where, what was chapter 16? It was chapter 15 and 16, the old regime. So it's together. That it, There's that one, and then there's the uh, social structure, like how. I don't know that it, it starts different. 
I think that was a chapter that we did together. I'll look at whenever we're done, see if I can help you figure that out. So um, what Napoleon is, is a military genius. Again, that's why Jason loves Napoleon. He's a military genius. That is what is able to bump him from just being a normal, what we call line officer above that. Um, and he is really good at that. He is exceptional. It is how France expands its borders. It's how Napoleon controls, again, almost all of Europe. He is an avid child of the Enlightenment. He reads all of these things. He looks at all of these things. And what we're going to find out, though, is he is definitely not an enlightened figure. He will be more like an enlightened despot. Um, he will only use those enlightened um, um, event or those enlightened thoughts and principles that don't take power away from him. And he's going to roll back a lot of the things that happened in the French Revolution. Um, and uh, we'll do that as well. Eventually inspired to divide a country during the directory into a unified nation, but at, and again, highlight at the expense of personal liberty. That again was one of the mantras of the French Revolution, right? Equality, fraternity, um, and liberty. And he's going to say, we got to give it back. Now, here's where that becomes important and why we talk about it in the way that we do. When nations are in times of crises, the people of that country are willing to give up liberties if it means security. So in our recent time period, not recent for you because you weren't born, but it's an event you have heard of and know a lot about, 9-11. So after 9-11 happened, people were willing to give up their liberties to feel secure. So prior to 9-11, airports were just like any other place. You could walk in, you could go right up to the gate to tell people goodbye. When people got off the plane, you could be standing right there. Um, no one checked your bag. I don't ever remember having my bag checked. Um, I don't ever remember showing an ID to say that was my name on the ticket. So that was one of the ways people gave up liberties. Like we're willing to do that to, to ensure that we're safe. That's not a stretch. But another one of the liberties that we were going to give up is removing the sacredness of uh, uh, church, temples, synagogues, mosques. We allowed people, it's called the Patriot Act, we allowed the government to record conversations without going through the proper processes of getting a wiretap. We allowed people to film people going in and out of mosques. That was a severe violation of our personal liberties. And everyone said, because of the terror that happened on that day, go ahead, do it. Yes. Is that still fun? What? That? None like, of that is. Like recording people? Yeah. The government to record your conversations? No. Okay. That is not allowed. They have to get a wiretap. No. Okay. Okay. Mm -mm. There are other states that you're not allowed to record people. There are, in the state of Illinois, you cannot record somebody on the phone without their consent. Other states just have a one consent party, which is the state of Indiana. But if you, what? What do you? Yeah, that was in California. It's illegal. Um, um, other states just have a one party consent indiana's one party consent and that one party would be you okay i consent but if you if you step over into illinois and you record somebody on the phone without having gone through the proper procedures yeah that's a violation so what can they do the filming who's going in and out they can't still do that no they cannot the pa that was called the patriot act and after we felt safe and after for many people that was a memory took about 10 years the patriot act was um um, repealed. And a lot of the repeal of the Patriot was those wiretaps. Yeah, the government cannot just record you or tap your phone. They have to go through uh, special channels. They have to prove that you are under suspicion for certain things. I think my phone goes to me all the time. 
Do what? I feel like my phone's always listening to me. Yeah. Well, in Indiana, you can. Anybody can record you in Indiana. You should know that when you talk on the phone. So what happens with Napoleon is the same thing. In this chaos that was the end of the French Revolution, the people of France said, we're willing to give up these liberties that we worked so hard for. And is that just a bad tasting apple? Or is... I, the what? Well, I thought this one was not clean. Oh. I like how the limit of my water last night. Okay. So this is what this is what that means for the people of France. They give up liberties for safety. And 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 nations and people do that all the time. It's a give and a take. So France says we are willing to roll back some of those liberties to go back to stability. And that will be the slogan of this chapter, put them back the way they was. My little Abner dog patch song from a musical. Put them back the way they were. Put them back the way they were. That's what this entire chapter is going to be about, both with Napoleon and the Congress of Vienna, because it's really two names that we got, two things we got going over here. Okay? So, the top of page two, we have the consulate period. Napoleon starts out, and this is where we'll see that absolute power corrupts absolute. That is one of the most oldest, most well cited, well documented historical phrases. Absolute power corrupts absolute. Um, and that's what's going to happen with Napoleon. He starts out as a child of enlightenment on the top of page two in the consulate. Um, and he takes power on December 25th, 1799, with the Constitution given supreme power to Napoleon. So, again, he is given absolute power. And as first consul, that is his title that he's given, Napoleon behaved more as an absolute ruler than a revolutionary statement. Statesman, I'm sorry, sought to govern France by demanding loyalty to the state. That should sound very familiar. Louis XIV said the same thing, right? I am the state. You must be loyal to me. He does rewardability. That will be something that he does mostly because of his long lasting issues with his own inferiority complex, feeling that he didn't belong that he had to work harder than everyone else. So he's going to reward people who have ability. It's called mediocrity, meaning you're going to advance in this uh, uh, nation, in this army because of your merits. And he is going to create an effective bureaucracy. And the reason he's going to be able to do that is his long standing uh, time in the military. If there is anything that the military can create, it is bureaucracy. Um, filling out paperwork that is in triplicate and quadruplicate and six forms at the same time. So one of the first things that he is going to do is called the Napoleonic Code. And as I just mentioned, one of the things that, uh, that Napoleon does that impacts the United States is selling the Louisiana Purchase of which uh, a main part of that was uh, now the state of New Orleans and then more importantly, the city of New Orleans and the state of Louisiana, I'm sorry, the state of Louisiana and the city of New Orleans. The state of Louisiana is very different from many other states. One is that it has parishes. It does not have counties or anything. And it has parishes because of its connection to the French Catholic Church. And so if you live in Louisiana, you live in Monroe Parish not Monroe County. You live um, in uh, that, uh, and, and they still use that. You also have a whole lot of laws and a whole lot of parishes that are still governed by what they call the Nap Napoleonic Code. Not like our law enforcement would hear uh, Indiana State Code or Indiana Penal Code. They use the Napoleonic Law or Napoleonic Code. So, this page two is a gigantic box because what you're often asked about Napoleon in writing is compare and contrast. 
Was Napoleon a child of the Enlightenment? Did Napoleon live up to the ideals of the French Revolution? And you need to be able to say yes and no, because that is the honest truth. Yes, he did. No, he did not. And the first thing we'll look at with this, did he live up to this enlightened uh, uh, French Revolution, is his Napoleonic Code. Legally unifying and giving the first clear and complete codification of French law. And again, remember, codification means written doll written down. And we get it straight away, B1A, perhaps the longest lasting legacy of Napoleon's rule. This is this is what lasts. This Napoleonic code, this system of laws, these rules will outlast Napoleon. It will outlast all the craziness that's getting ready to happen when Napoleon dies, just as a um, uh, foreshadowing of what's going to happen when Napoleon dies. France does not know what it wants to be. Are we going to go back to a monarchy and have another King Louis? Are we going to go back to Napoleon? And we'll get to the point where we'll have rulers in France called Louis Napoleon III. Because they don't know what they want to be. It is about to be crazy time in France when Napoleon is removed. So it includes a civil code. And a civil code is what um, individuals sue each other about. Um, dog bites. A tree fell on my fence, um, that kind of lawsuit like you see on Judge Judy. Um, code of criminal procedure. And again, every I think and hope everyone understands uh, what that is about. And then a commercial code. This is about business. This is contract law, what businesses can do. And then lastly, a penal code, and that is punishment and what we will do and can do uh, uh, with uh, criminals. And again, at this point, in our criminal, look at criminal um, punishments and codes. It is about punishment. It is not about rehabilitation. It is severe punishment. Um, during this time period, if you were arrested, um, you were dealt with incredibly harshly. Um, uh, the jail didn't buy your food or provide you with clothing. Someone had to bring it to you. Uh, you did work, and the work was work not work for the sake of work, not work for the sake of product. And two of the things in particular, one would be called walking a wheel. So if you can imagine like a big um, wheel, like either on the back of a paddle boat, like a steam, like one of those old Dixieland things that are on the Mississippi or um, a, something that turns. So those cogs are out and all you would do in this space was stand and walk the wheel. You would just walk it. 12 hours standing there walking the wheel or the ever popular busting up big rocks into little rocks. What did you want to say? Yeah. Well, this was punishment. Okay. Well, that was yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, so that, and then again, the, one of the other things they'll do is they will and uh, off the coast of South America, they will have a uh, penal colony called Devil's Island, and it will just be a place where they will send prisoners across the Atlantic Ocean and drop them off on that island. And there you go. You're there for the rest of your life. It's a horrific, horrific thing. Um, resulted in a strong central government and administrative unity. Um, see, many achievements of the revolution were made permanent. So these are the things that we want to look at. Um, equality before the law. And they Excuse me. Again, that's a very easy thing for a powerful, enlightened despot or emperor to do. Above the law, in front of the bench, everyone is equal. And again, Napoleon upholds that. No more states, no more legal classes, no more privileges, no more hereditary offices. All that's gone. The next one is freedom of religion, for real. Right. He for real provides freedom of religion. Um, state was secular, meaning the state was not governed by religious um, um, or religious moral values or religious holidays or any of those things. Property rights, we still abolished and kept with the um, abolition of serfdom and gave women inheritance rights. So women have the right to keep their inheritance. 
However, that does not mean equal status, right? So that's one of the things that Napoleon could give. All right, I will let women keep whatever they have inherited. Now, the problem with that is going to be, and let's just make sure we figure this all out. So um, Callie gets to keep the inheritance that her father gave her. So let's say she's got a hundred acres um, and a big uh, house and a business. That is great. But as a woman, Callie cannot enter into a contract. So she would have to have someone help her sell it or run the business. Callie is not entitled to open or have a bank account. So she would still. So you would need to make sure, correct. None. That's what I'm saying. You need to deep dive into what this means. So you can inherit stuff, but you still have no authority over that inheritance. So even if you have like, if, even though you inherit the inheritance, like you still can't really get Right. It. it stays in your name, but, and it stays with you, but you still would have to obviously have someone that you trust very well to help you manage it. Um, women and children are legally dependent on their husbands and fathers. Uh, divorce more difficult. Women could not buy or sell property. So again, your inheritance, great, you have it, but you can't buy it or sell it. You can't start a business. So all of those things are not allowed to you. Income earned by wives went to their husbands. And as always, penalties for adultery were far more severe for women than men. So on the, when you just look at this, oh, they get inheritance rights. Again, doesn't really mean much. The top of page three is careers open to talent. This is one of the things Napoleon does in regards to the fact of his own inadequacy and his own inferiority. Um, citizens theoretically were able to rise in government service purely according to their abilities. And again, creation of new imperial nobility to reward most talented generals and officials. However, Napoleon is again, like many people that ascend to power, who have inferiority complexes, they are still overawed by those people who are their betters. Does that make sense? So instead of what, what I think most people would think, you have this inferiority complex, you've been treated horribly by all these elitist people your whole life, and when I get into power, you guys are going down. Your psyche still admires them and still wants to be them. So instead of taking them down, you rise them up because you want to be in their circle. Does that make sense? Same thing is going to happen in the United States after Lincoln dies and President Johnson becomes president, who was a uh, Tennessee seamstress poor dude that was kicked around by white plantation owners his whole life. He always wanted to be that. And you would have thought because of the poor treatment that he had from them, that he would have held them to the fire. No, he so wants their admiration. He lets them get away with stuff. And Napoleon does the same, even though he feels inferior to these people, he still has this deep sense of wanting to belong with them. So um, wealth determined status, middle class is going to benefit significantly. The, go the government rewarded wealthy people who effectively served the states with pensions, properties, or titles. And again, the only difference now is that Napoleon gives these to the military. That's the people that he admired. He creates 3,600 titles. That is a tremendous amount. Um, 2D, he grants amnesty. So let's talk about what amnesty means. It's a word that's used quite often. Um, amnesty means that whatever you did that could have been illegal 
or um, immoral or prosecutable is no longer going to be done to you. So I can think of one that's fairly simple that doesn't involve anybody admitting to a crime. And it's at the library. For some crazy reason, our library still charges fines. I don't think they should do that. They're a public institution that gets tax dollars. I do not think they should be able to fine you just for having a book late. Just don't think that's the right thing to do. Anyway, do what? Yeah, and they're gonna charge you a fine and it's paid for by tax dollars. It's what? Yeah, it bothers me immensely. I don't think they, Vigo County's library doesn't charge fines. It bothers me. So because of that, I, I think two things happen. I'm just going on my tirade about the Vigo County li or the, the Sullivan County Public Library. I think they don't have a lot of patrons because of that. People don't want to pay a fine. Vigo County doesn't charge a fine. If I have Mew, I would take my library card. Do you have your own vehicle now? Well, yeah, soon. I would take my library card to Vigo County because they will give you a, a library card as a person that already has and right, get your books out of Vigo County because you will not be charged a fine and you can read them until you're done with them. And See, not. I can't even get books out on my account now because I have a very open like nine. Right. So now when I check the right. Out, I have so here's what you need to listen to. You are the person I need to talk to. Amnesty. Every now and then the Sullivan County Public Library has a month of amnesty. And what they say is, and I'm not sure how they do it. If you return the old book or whatever, they will remove your fines. So pay attention. They don't do it very often, but pay attention. Um, so Amnesty means you're not going to be charged with whatever crime you committed. So all of our 100,000 nobles that left that were in um, um, absenteeism, charged with treason, bless you, charged with treason or whatever they were charged with, Napoleon says, hey, we want you all to come back and we're not going to charge you with those crimes. That's Amnesty. We won't charge you. Immigrants are people that left France, mostly nobles who left because they knew they were going to get their heads chopped off. Many soon occupied high posts. Some notables from foreign countries served the empire with distinction. And please look at F, and there's a reason F is underlined. Working class movement was no longer politically significant. Why? Because workers were denied the right to form unions. How did all of this start? How did all of the French Revolution start? Working people revolting first for the price of bread. And so Napoleon sees that. He says, okay, not letting that happen again. Poor people, working people, you can't have unions. You can't gather. He will actually uh, uh, by the time we're done, have laws that restrict the number of people that can gather under one cause. Because the understanding being large groups of people in a mob do crazy things. Napoleon's biggest and most critical issue. Oh, we're not going to do that. We're going to save the church. Okay. I didn't see what time it was. Bye, Kimberly.